the confluence of regulatory, market, and competitive forces propelled by the introduction of new payment infrastructure capabilities, the migration to new payment standards such as uh, XML ISO 20022, uh, albeit delayed by the current pandemic, and the pressure to effectively compete amid growing market disruption present financial institutions significant opportunities and challenges to transform your core payment infrastructure and introduce new capabilities. In this session, we will debate the key issues impacting the ongoing transformation of the payment business and share your varied experiences and different approaches to prepare for the future. Uh, to get us started, we have our TAB research head, Mobasha, who will share a short presentation of some of the key oh, trends okay. driving transformation in the payment landscape today. Thank you, Gun Ping. Um, as you mentioned, from a, from a payments uh, landscape perspective here in Asia Pacific, certainly about a decade ago, the, the landscape uh, here was dominated by simple cash, checks, bank cards, um, different preferred uh, payment types. Uh, but that payment landscape has dramatically transformed um, in recent years. It would be hard to imagine that a few years ago, cash was uh, has become a really uh, almost obsolete in, in countries uh, such as China with mobile wallets becoming uh, ubiquitous. Uh, you've got payments that are increasingly smaller um, and, you know, uh, essentially coming uh, from end consumers um, and, and really looking at retail consumers that are driving those retail um, uh, and real-time payments. Um, we're also seeing, of course, the introduction of uh, distribution ledger technology, which is enabling payment systems um, and is contributing really uh, from a, a transformation perspective. To give you an example, the, the rise of central bank digital currencies, uh, which is really shaping the, the cross-border payments uh, scene. Um, and as more countries in Asia are, are focused on building up that anytime, anywhere, anyone real-time payment systems, the potential of save using QR codes, uh, reading apps that are backed by those real-time uh, payment rails that is facilitating uh, payments for corporates has provided a very strong use case for um, uh, you know moving batch and daily processing to to real-time systems. This is also enabled governments uh, that have created national payment infrastructures that are now supporting mobile instant payments uh, and really allowing them to harness the widespread use of smartphones and technology such as digital IDs. Um, increased tokenization and QR codes to be able to make and receive, of course, low-cost real-time payments uh, between bank accounts and or to digitally top up mobile wallets. Um, and as Bunping mentioned, from, from a regulation perspective as well, we're seeing the global adoption of ISO 2022 standards, uh, which will be driving payment efficiency, interoperability, and streamlining of uh, inter-FI communication. We're also likely to see a continued reduction in costs of cross-border payments as flows become more transparent. So payments uh, remain, of course, an important and a very substantial factor in the bank's operating cost base and sometimes uh, representing about a third of uh, total operating costs. And that's partly driven due to the high technology spend associated with providing payments uh, payment services. But having said that, you know, a disproportionate share of effort and resources is required to maintain and improve infrastructure, to manage those upgrades, to implement the rule changes, and to rationalize the use of legacy technology. While this does leave insufficient resources for sorely needed digitiz digitization efforts, uh, we are seeing that, uh, you know, the investment in new customer services and applications does pay off. So despite this challenge, most FIs across the region have undertaken uh, that journey towards upgrading their existing legacy payment infrastructures that are presently saddled with fragmentation and the lack of scalability. Um, we're also seeing payment infrastructures that are enabling greater platform adaptability, flexibility, and operational efficiency with faster processing and clearing back by more streamlined data movement, uh, which is aligned with key industry standardization. Uh, more importantly, these new payment infrastructures um, are enabling FIs to be better prepared for the ongoing and evolving regulatory IT and market-driven sector changes such as instant payments, open banking adoption, PSD2, and perhaps proliferation of alternative payment methods. So ensuring the compliance and shielding the customer uh, experience really from this type of disruption 
uh, will allow banks to free up the capacity they need to develop new products and to enable new customer experiences. Interestingly, we're also seeing, uh, as I mentioned, these new payment systems that are being rolled out across Asia. And I'll just probably just uh, uh, share a couple of examples. Um, so uh, the HKMA in Hong Kong, it launched the faster payment system uh, you know, to address the increasing market needs for more efficient retail payment services. So you have all banks and e-wallet operators in Hong Kong that are participating here and it's enabled customers to make those cross-bank or e-wallet payments easily uh, simply by entering their phone, mobile phone number or the email address of the recipient. In India, you have the, the United Unified Payments Interface, the UPI, which is a system that you know, powers multiple bank accounts into a single mobile application uh, of any one of those participating banks. And uh, you know, they've merged several banking features, seamless fund route, routing and merchant payments under one umbrella. And they're also catering to peer-to-peer to -peer collection requests, which can be scheduled and paid as per uh, convenience. Um, similarly, in Indonesia, you have Bank Indonesia, which is preparing other initiatives based on its 2025 payment system roadmap, uh, which includes a data hub and a real-time real payment system called DI Fast. Um, in Thailand, you have PromPay, which is a, a rather modern, convenient, and low-cost payment infrastructure. Uh, it's also enabling the public and business sectors to transfer funds using a mobile phone number, a national identification number, or, or a corporate registration number. Um, but interestingly, the competition uh, within the banking sector is also playing an important role in at least in terms of propelling the widespread use of prompt pay and, 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 and that is also contributing to reduce uh, or uh, lowering of fees for, for cross bank uh, fund transfers via these electronic channels. A review of some of the, the new players that we're seeing that are disintermediating banks in the payment space is, is quite interesting to watch. Um, as various pro providers are scrambling now for market share, we're seeing a consolidation in this sector that is driving new volumes. Um, you have the card schemes such as Visa and MasterCard that have made moves into fintech with the recent acquisition of bank account data aggregators, whether it's uh, Visa's acquisition of Plaid and MasterCard's acquisition of Fincity. Uh, and so this does show us a, a trend of expansion to a global diversified uh, business strategy uh, in financial services. On the other hand, you have domestic players and real-time bank interbank transfers such as RoopPay, Shazam, WeChat Pay, M-Pesa, which is reducing dependence in global card networks. Um, last year, uh, recently, Japan-based Soramitsu also rolled out a next-generation payment network. Um, and uh, you know that's enabling real-time payments online and via smartphones. Uh, in Cambodia, interestingly, where you have 78% of the population over the age of 15, uh, that does not have access to banking services. And we're seeing the, the uh, you know, with the rollout of uh, the Backcong platform that has uh, enabled the enrollment of, of thousands of, of uh, users. Um, and more recently with, uh, with Apple's release of uh, the Apple card and uh, with a number of companies following suit, uh, such as Venmo and Razor, uh, as well as Samsung Pay and, and Shopify, uh, so there's quite a quite an interesting mix of uh, big tech fintechs that are that are now operating in in, in this payments space. So speaking of uh, these big techs, uh, say Alibaba's Alipay and Tencent's We Tencent's uh, WeChat Pay, uh, that have really created their own payment services with many other companies following suit, and and they're they're creating their own pay businesses. Um, and so whether it's GoPay by GoCheck or GrabPay by Grab, uh, BigPay by AirAsia and LinePay, just to name a few. Uh, governments and regulators are, are really playing a significant role in encouraging digital payments and directing uh, new pathways for innovation. So with instant and real-time payment schemes that are live in and across 15 Asian markets, you're seeing real-time account to account payments, which is becoming the industry norm. Uh, the use of real-time payments is also expanding from not just from consumer to consumer use cases enabled by third-party apps, but also to consumer to business, uh, both for online and offline payments. So given this emerging threat, the industry, the banking industry is of course responding to this uh, fast changing payments landscape and there are a range of payment uh, initiatives launched by the various banks and payment service providers. Uh, just to call out a few, we have, for instance, Siam Commercial Bank that is seeking to capitalize on, on new opportunities and growth. 
uh, uh, in, the, in the cross border payment corridors um, powered by RippleNet, especially for markets uh, outside Southeast Asia. Similarly, Krungstri has teamed up with uh, the Japanese tech giant uh, NTT Data to launch MyPromp QR, a cross border QR code payment platform for Thai's uh, users in Japan. Um, in the Philippines, there's Union Bank's digital transformation to drive uh, inclusive banking, which has really led uh, to the bank's fintech subsidiary UBX to launch three platform startups. That includes the I2I, uh, which is linking rural banks to the country's main financial network uh, that cuts across digital payments and, and logistics uh, platform, uh, BUX, uh, that supports uh, e-commerce merchants. So while you do have some of the older uh, uh, tech firms that are that are you know settling in on on the seamless integration and uh, into the lucrative financial sphere, I, I believe the path for Asian tech tech firms um, uh, and Asian institutions uh, in the financial service uh, space appears more straightforward. Um, certainly, there are limits and opportunities, but uh, uh, you know if if we if we keep in mind the Chinese market, which is still being explored. But from a regulatory uh, regime perspective, uh, we're unlikely to see any uh, new surprises uh, in terms of new operators uh, uh, being able to enter and to support uh, the, uh, the, the, the growth of um, um, uh, real-time payments. Uh, certainly, um, you know, it will be an interesting uh, landscape to see as the shift from uh, the application of legacy systems to new real-time scalable adaptable payment infrastructures are implemented and rolled out, um, which will drive those operational efficiencies uh, and, and, uh, and, and and lead to uh, uh, observable uh, benefits for, for the banking industry and the, the payment sectors, uh, payment service providers as well. There are new infrastructure being set up. Uh, there are also new uh, payments uh, provided today. Uh, with the introduction of open banking and, and new financial services license, for example, the payment area uh, is now open to the non-banks as well. And today, you know, payments margins are very low. Uh, with historical low interest rates as well, uh, you need to develop new business model in order to compete. So uh, I'd like to get our panel to, to talk about some of these trends and how is that impacting your uh, respective institutions and, and more from a regional cross-border uh, perspective, if we can get uh, Chin Tan uh, to share your uh, comments and your response to the trends that you see. You know, we know Deutsche Bank has got you know, a, a very uh, 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 effective uh, uh, multi-currency payment engines and uh, and, and how are you looking at regional payment cross-border payments opportunities as well as this move towards a new payment infrastructure? You've seen clearly emergence of new age payment methods. You've seen significant improvement on payment transparency through on, especially on cross-border payments with, with the introduction of SWIFT GPI and adoption of that by banks and corporates. Third, we have seen significant interest of clients to adopt this payment solutions to improve their end consumer experience. So clients are now no more looking at payments as just treasury payments or the vendor payments, but they're looking at payments as an enabler of improving their consumer experience and getting more digital in the way they drive their business. We've been working very closely with our clients on helping them transform their business model, not just treasury payment practices. Fourth, that has enabled us to also look at our backend infrastructure around the new age payment method. So we had to work on building our payments infrastructure to cater to large volumes of low value payments as compared to uh, simpler forms of vendor payments earlier. Second, we needed to adopt to a much greater 24 by seven infrastructure across the region. While it is easier said, it's much more difficult in terms of implementing it when it comes to uh, solving that uh, for, our, for our corporate clients. So uh, that 24 by seven infrastructure played a key role. We also looked at our entire payment lifecycle management in terms of simplifying it, such that the orchestration layer for the payment lifecycle sits in this uh, in this engine rather than in multiple electronic channels, which was also the legacy setup that we had. So we migrated the entire routing logic from channels into our payment lifecycle management layer, as we call. Uh, that has been a development. Particularly on the cross-border payments, we have continued to look at investments on our FX for cash engine. Uh, that is, again, our, our way to complement all of the digital solutions 
around payments and integrating payments, FX, and liquidity solutions onto a single uh, front-to-back solution for our clients, which digitizes payments, which uh, uh, which executes FX on a uh, on an automated basis based on rules pre pre agreed with our clients, whether the rules are in terms of margin or rules are in terms of picking up hedges. So it's been a great experience. I see this space constantly evolving. Uh, it's it's never static and to adapt to the new payment methods as they come up, to adapt to client needs, and to adapt to the regulatory changes has been the kind of dynamic play. And mm-hmm. hence, the entire like, payments infrastructure. We also want to get in a domestic, maybe from a more uh, retail uh, payment uh, uh, perspective as well. SCB has gone through a, a retail payment uh, implementation. T- tell us what the process that you went through in terms of what drove that uh, new that project, uh, as well as some of the capabilities and uh, the challenges that you uh, went through in, in that implementation? As um, the, the presentation earlier from, from TAB said, right, mm-hmm. that uh, Thailand have uh, set up the project called PromPay, and PromPay have turned the, the nation into a different scheme, and all the payment is become zero free and we start to have a lot of micro payment happen so the the challenge right now is is more on the scalability and and also we start to see a lot of new innovation for example all those qr payment and some of the new capability uh, regarding the, the payment in, in in the system as well so i think at the moment we we try to create the the banking as a platform and try to uh, enable all those new fintech and some of our third party partner to be able to use our in payment infrastructure inside the bank to leverage the, the platform that we have right now payment is almost we got nothing but the the usefulness of payment is more on the data mm-hmm. so yes. we we are now try to enable the event streaming in real time and in the background try to make sure that all the events that happen throughout the payment flow, we can create the moment of truth for our customer. Swift has been um, working on GPI and uh, lately also GPI instant and, and you've been also more involved on the retail payment front. Tell, tell us more. We just are finalized our new strategy that we introduced publicly um, into the market, which was a result of working with our customers around the world. And we have 12,000 customers connected to Swift um, and consulting with them for the best, best part of 12 months. And, you know, the industry needs to change clearly. But I think it's not an evenly applied set of disintermediation, right? So you have these different mm. segments of the industry. They're not all affecting um, industry incumbents in the same way. Um, but one theme I think is on the, the customer experience. So, you know, new, new entrants are putting themselves between a traditional financial institution and, and the customers of that financial institution and that they're improving the experience that the customer has when they want to make a payment. So they're able to track that payment end to end. They might be getting fees quoted up front, um, they have you know choices and they have have an enhanced experience. So that is a particular opportunity for financial institutions to to work with. Um, if you're a bank, your operating cost base is increasingly high, right? And there are drivers of that. You, you need to source liquidity and funding to support payments. Financial climate compliance is a really heavy burden that just increases all, all the time. It seems right. Um, and then the role of new technology, so pivoting to API oriented technology and and cloud. Um, These are some of the major ones, not all of them, but the things that our customers are responding to. So what what we've done is we've published a a new strategy designed to support our customers, you know, work with those trends such that they can continue to play a very strong role in um, cross-border and also domestic payments as well. So what what we're saying there is that um, all of our transactions where possible will be done on an instant basis, you know, um, they'll be friction free, meaning that what we're about is really identify these problems and these frictions that exist at scale 
in the industry for that financial crime and compliance problem I mentioned. Can you help the industry by mutualising or centralising services such that the cost burden is not duplicated across individual banks and it could be shared? Mm. And we think we can do that through um, a centralised um, platform service for that as well. So, you know, we're about help, helping our customers with this instant friction-free account-to-account experience. Um, and then the last thing, just very quickly, you mentioned 2022, the ISO standard. Um, mm. We're introducing that across the globe on our network um, from the end of um, the year 2022. So, so you'll have all this additional data that can be used in a consistent way um, um, by our customers to do um, compliance and financial crime checks, screening, that kind of thing. And you also have additional data back to that user and customer experience I mentioned. You can apply that data into that intelligence that goes into the way that financial institutions serve their customers. So we'll soon be rolling out a new um, transaction management service, which is a centralised platform that allows banks to actually um, you know, consume some of these things on a shared basis and all these things don't have to be done on an individual basis, fully API or third cloud interfaces, that, that kind of thing. One of the things that we discuss a lot of the processes, uh, there are different systems that uh, require different processes and uh, not all are automated. Uh, what is driving uh, transformation of payments at Mandiri? A lot of fintechs are, are trying to uh take some of the, 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 the portion of what, what banks are used to have uh, on the, the revenue. And then uh, recently, some fintech are playing on a local scheme. Like uh, there, there are one fintech called OI and Flip. Uh, basically, they are offering a, a domestic transfer uh, on a free basis. Um, but of course, they, they, they cannot... They have, they, they cannot uh, go big scale as they need. Basically, they're using the concept of uh, correspondent banking. So what they do is that they open multiple accounts in many banks, uh, but of course they need to have some kind of capital, right, to execute the payments. So what we did in Mandiri uh, for the wholesale part, we improve our API. We right now already have an API portal that can be used by our corporate customers. So we see more of the corporate customers uh, use the host to host connections rather than internet banking. And on the uh, SME or the retail space, uh, we basically uh, collaborate with, with FinTech rather than competition with them, we collaborate with them in providing some uh, payments using QR. We in, embed our QR payments into their system. So their customers can, can, can make payments uh, using the QR payments. And then we also uh, have branchless banking agents. Basically, we, we try to uh, expand our network rather than opening new branches. So we see quite a lot of tractions there, especially in the area where we don't have branches. And surprisingly, the, 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 the customers uh, are uh, depositing quite a lot of cash there. So uh, more and more uh, initiative towards cashless happening here in Indonesia right now. Um, and uh, yeah, and then, and, 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 yeah, go ahead. And uh, the government is also, uh, the regulator is also uh, provide, uh, was that supporting us in this by, by uh, recent, uh, I think uh, last year, I think they, they issue a standardized uh, QR payment, QR payment standards for all banks. In the past, there's no standard. I think mm -hmm. the government tried to standardize that. So at least everybody in the same position right now, rather than before. We also want to hear from Kanaf at uh, CIMB. Um, he is uh, also in charge of the transformation uh, function at CIMB. Tell us in terms of how you see payment uh, transformation. The, the customers don't wake up uh, thinking in the morning what payment materials they're going to use or what the bank payment is a hidden uh, activity that comes in your daily life uh, when you're buying things or when you're paying for goods or services. Um, so from that perspective, the uh, simple thing that uh, we want to do is to make sure wherever the customer is uh, and however he wants to pay for his goods or services, we are there as a choice. Number two is from a technology and a commercial perspective, payments is a 
is no longer a revenue game for banks. So the hmm. real value is in trying to ensure the technology and operations are so streamlined that your cost of providing that payments at scale is as minimum as possible. And two is uh, within that cost, uh, there's a huge cost of fraud and uh, uh, and uh, cyber uh, security aspects. And how do we ensure mm -hmm. that those payments uh, and the fraud losses are kept minimum uh, as much as possible? So that's where uh, the real uh, game is in, in terms of uh, where we're going. The last point is um, since I mean, we talk about disintermediation, but I would argue that there is a mix of disintermediation and uh, a long tail of transactions coming into financial uh, institutions, which never existed before because of stuff like QR, because of stuff like uh, waving uh, credit cards and because of uh, uh, transactions uh, or, um, you know, government initiatives like do it now or pay now, etc. So you have a large number of minute uh, microtransactions coming into the ecosystem, which means the volumes are definitely going up. Now, the game over there is definitely a data game. And uh, the real disintermediation is the customer getting lost to uh, these wallets and other providers and the fintech players up front. So your customer relationship is what is going to be ending up disintermediated. Payments is not going to get disintermediated. So the real game that we are trying to play is how do we keep ourselves plugged into the ecosystem so that a payment is done, but we get to understand and be part of uh, the customer relationship. If you have a customer relationship and we do cross-border payments, and if the relationship is good, the customer is not going to move to somebody else to do your cross-border remittance. He's going to be sticking with you. So as long as you stick to that, then you get the moment. I also want to hear from our colleagues in the Philippines. Uh, first, Dennis, who is the Chief Information Officer at Union Bank, who's, uh, which is doing interesting things on the digitization front. Tell us in terms of, of the transformation on the payment uh, side that Union Bank is going through. We actually started really uh, working on a blockchain uh, center of excellence. And uh, one of the things that we did was to create a network uh, for the various rural banks in the Philippines. So the situation in the Philippines is that the number of rural banks in the Philippines are dwindling. It's, it's really going down. But the number of rural bank clients are actually increasing. So what's the reason for that? It's, it's because the rural banks are not able to keep up with the costs of uh, you know, having sophisticated AMLASIS. Our, our belief in the financial uh, inclusion, or actually we, we call it a prosperity inclusion, yeah. is to work with the rural banks because the rural banks are very much embedded in the communities uh, that they are into. So we have rural banks that focuses on you know, teachers uh, we, we have uh, those for farmers, uh, drivers, etc. And what we do is we visited them. And they're really just not interconnected uh, at all. Mm -hmm. So we created a, a blockchain-based switch. And now there's like a, close to 100 rural banks into the platform. That allows them to now uh, you know, avail of the services. Like in the Philippines, we have uh, what we call Instapay, uh, which is the replacement of ATM. And by the way, as a statistics uh, for all of you guys, in the last three months, the Instapay transactions uh, is more than the ATM transactions. This has never happened before. This is the first time. And in the last three months, it's happened. And then we have PesoNet, which is like our alternative for, for issuing checks. So those things have really been growing tremendously, especially during the COVID-19. Uh, and... Part of what we did also, maybe just uh, three things, you know, we had the digital account opening. Uh, so that means, you know, they can open an account anywhere. We had the mobile check deposits. So they can just take a picture of the check and deposit it so they can load. And then we did the cash out uh, services. Uh, so meaning they can remit uh, to, you know, all, all parts of the country. So they can all do all of these things at the comforts of their home. And then during lockdown, you know, we, we did a what we call a banking on wheels. So we had like the entire bank. So, so those that are quarantined and they cannot go out, we bring the banking to them. See, the Banco Central ng mm. Pilipinas has really been very progressive and supporting uh, electronic payments. Yes, and uh, I'll call on your counterpart, your colleague in the, in the Philippines, uh, Lito uh, from RCBC. And, and Lito were working in the Telco, sorry, uh, and uh, on payments, and now you're working for RCBC, and also working uh, for it to become a, a one of its first uh, domestic digital only bank. Tell us more in terms of uh, on the payment trans transformation. I shall first uh, start with the in terms of contextualizing 
the, the payments transformation in the country, in the, in the Philippines. So uh, amidst this pandemic, what we have seen is the exponential growth of digital transactions because of the limited mobility of the Filipinos given the quarantine uh, based on different levels of restrictions. We have seen that a number of them have really shifted their transactions to digital. And that's why we have seen those numbers uh, really skyrocketing. For example, for RCBC, we've seen uh, you know, a three digit up to four digit uh, growth when it comes to digital transaction. I think one of the, if the basic uh, metrics no, of success would definitely be consumer adoption because one is that we are now adhering or trying to embrace the concept of PSD2 because right now the BSP has uh, came up with uh, a draft guidelines on what they call the open finance framework which is practically open banking and of course the proliferation or the the introduction of the uh, standard QR code in the country where Practically, it now promotes interoperability across all players uh, in the industry. In the case of the Philippines, I mean, there is harmony uh, and there is what we call competition amongst fintech and bank players in the country because, again, of interoperability, because of us being able to provide that synergy across all players in the industry. These are the things that we've been trying to do. RCBC has been one of the you know, traditional banks uh, for the past 60, 60 years, and I think the digital transformation agenda has been uh, number one in terms of priority. We have invested a lot in terms of digitalization, and one of which is when we launch what we call the Discard Tech um, mobile app. No? This is actually the first uh, uh, taglish inclusion super app in the Philippines. And in fact, when we launched that in the middle of the, of, the, of the lockdown, we were thinking that it might not actually be noticed at all by the public because the public has been very concerned about their safety, their security, and we hit our highest unemployment rate at, at 25%. So when we, when we launched our uh, Discard Tech uh, super app, we were supposed to launch it uh, on March 18, but government declared the hard lockdown on March 16. So in July, that gave us an opportunity to launch it. And again, we were not expecting any acceptance from the public because again, uh, given the pandemic, but we were, it was a pleasant surprise amongst, uh, I mean, to, to all of us that it was embraced by the public. And if the number of downloads, uh, mobile app downloads, has been, we reached one, three million over uh, now close to four million in a matter of four months. So practically on the average of one million per month in terms of downloads. Uh, we reached one million after 30 days from the time that we launched it. And so I think because of, again, because of the, you know, the timing, uh, and I think even the proposition that it offers to the public, to the consumers, would be practically unique. So I think um, that's why even our monthly active user rate is as high as 72%. So positive social sentiment is as high as 98%. So, I mean, this would be some of the metrics that we cannot actually don't really see in most of the mobile apps in the country right now, because in the Philippines, you have almost 200 mobile apps operating um, currently on top of having about 4 million mobile apps operating globally. So imagine, your proposition here is how can you be noticed yep. by the consumer? Now, then we want to look at uh, digital transformation uh, or payment transformation, um, how different institutions are uh, approaching it from a technology and from an infrastructure perspective. Can, can I call Stephen from FIS to maybe uh, give us some insight on the different approaches uh, of different institutions and what are the, some of the challenges that you know, are involved in, in a, a holistic uh, payment transformation. So um, I'm just going to go through a, a couple of transformation drivers. So we have, of course, legacy systems and, and, and legacy operating models, uh, which dominate uh, a lot of the banking landscape, uh, ranging from the core banking systems, which aren't 24 by 7, uh, also to uh, some of the peripheral systems, chan channels reporting, warehousing, etc., which are in in different states of modernness and openness and, and ready for uh, a, a true transformative uh, offering. Uh, on the back of that, you have an unprecedented number of compliance changes in the region. Uh, in, in all of my global experience, I've never seen uh, the amount of compliance which is being uh, um, put onto the banks across the region, uh, whether that's real-time payments, um, 
bulk payments, RTGFs, uh, and and SWIFT cross-border payments, all happening uh, and overlapping uh, a lot of the time. So uh, it, it's really a, a perfect storm of compliance dr drivers as um, as well as new payments competition. And even just this week, we, we heard some big news out of Google uh, with their launch of Plex. Uh, obviously, the, app, the Apple, um, Apple card is, is quite interesting uh, to see how that goes. But more regionally, you have a tremendous competition in the fintechs from <clears throat> the likes of Grab and Gojek and Alipay and so on. So it's really a, a difficult space for banks to, to become differentiated with their offerings and to remain relevant in terms of their uh, offerings to the market and taking that piece of the, uh, of the payments business. And, <clears throat> um, so one of the things that we see uh, across the region, as I said, is, is legacy payment architectures. And, and that really makes it uh, transformation slow and expensive for, for a lot of banks. Uh, often there's a lot of payment logic embedded in those channels. That's logic which is required to um, uh, know how that payment should be processed and where the payment needs to be routed to. Um, you know, is it a bulk payment? Is it an RTGS? Is it cross-border real-time? Also about how that payment should be um, processed using uh, the sanction system or core banking or GL, treasury, etc. cetera. Um, a lot of logic which probably doesn't really belong in the channels. Um, the, the integration is, becomes a bit of a spaghetti because for every payment type that a channel wants to um, implement, it needs a separate connection to all those different silos. That makes it rigid and flexible for, for payment processing. And, and really, I see all of these payment types actually blurring together. Um, and, and probably in the future, maybe in a decade or so, there will only be one real-time payment type which dominates both domestic and international payments, I believe. And you'll have all of these different payment types disappear. And then you have a very complicated enterprise integration architecture at the back end. So every payment scheme or silo is typically connected to every kind of uh, uh, legacy system in the bank, whether it's core, GL, FX, risk, warehousing, etc. Very, very complicated uh, set of infrastructures and, and uh, challenges for banks to maintain. And there's a huge cost to keeping it all running. So payment hubs have evolved as a response to, to managing those four, chan uh, four uh, challenges. So what we see and what we recommend to our customers is that not only do they need to meet those four challenges, but they also need to deliver a platform that can really unlock innovation in the payment space and help banks to remain relevant and, and also still deliver differentiated services. So simplifying your channel integration is the first step in that journey and, and you will have lots of different channels uh, and you want to simplify it down to a single point of entry as far as possible. The second is to have a standardized enterprise integration architecture. So instead of having all the payment silos connected into your uh, legacy systems, you want to keep that uh, centralized and standardized through uh, one or two touch points per system. You want to move all of your payments logic from your channels into what we call the payment order management layer. And what that is going to do is allow you to do some very intelligent payment processing and routing scenarios. And so for example, you'll be able to uh, have a choice in real time about how the payment, which might've been initiated on a mobile phone, should it go through the bulk channel, through to go through the RTGS, cross-border, real time, or or some other new payment type which might arise. So there's no fixed kind of routing or, or distribution which is determined in the channels. It's all worked out in real time. And you can set the criteria to be price driven, to be SLA driven or, or whatsoever. And also, um, you know, Michael mentioned, there's, there's a hell of a lot of in, innovation happening with SWIFT, both in cross-border and the, and the RTGS space. But there's actually a lot of, um, competition driving, arriving in the cross-border payments market as well. So we have Visa with Earthport and Visa Payments Limited. You have MasterCard Send and they're building out that capability uh, with Vocalink quite extensively. Uh, you have a lot of other networks which are appearing with Ripple and uh, Quarter and so forth. So 
you will have choice as well in, in the different uh, cross-border markets. And you want to be able to take advantage of that because each of those will offer different uh, advantages and different price points and service levels for your customers. So, so these are the four things that we call out as, as a major uh, characteristics of a successful payments transformation. But what are some of the more common uh, challenges that, that banks face in different channels, that are different systems, and many of them critical to, to their operations? Um, how do they prioritize in terms of you know, uh, putting everything onto a uh, kind of new platform? I think historically in Asia, as a general statement, there hasn't been a lot of investment in, in payments infrastructure for the last uh, 10, even maybe 20 years. Uh, some countries have launched real-time payment scheme initiatives, mm -hmm. Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, Hong Kong, etc. And, 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 but that wasn't quite enough to trigger a, a complete modernization initiative in banks. So typically they had point solutions, which they would stand up and they would be... Uh, on new infrastructure or, or more likely to, than not, they would leverage the existing infrastructure. Um, what we're seeing now with that perfect storm of compliance is that the, the catalyst for change is really too much than the existing banking systems and architectures can, can handle. The databases or the payments databases are not ISO 222. So they have a major challenge in managing the data in and out and, and maintaining compliance. And depending on the kind of bank you are and whether you're doing intermediary banking, the challenge may be multiplied with the arrival of real-time payments. You may have core banking servicing issues running 24 by seven. You may have liquidity issues. And if you're a bank which has a regional footprint, uh, th those challenges are multiplied if you want to maintain uh, liquidity across your operational sphere. So they're the kind of things that we see, but you know, we have impact into uh, sanctions and screening. It's now a requirement of, of uh, many regulators that you have to screen every single payment mm -hmm. and whether you need to do that in the, in a, uh, in the full um, beauty, the full terror of ISO 222 or, or a truncated form of that uh, varies from, from market to market. So right. banks are also starting to uh, address or implement data lakes as, as a step in, in, in uh, collecting that data and then using that as a competitive advantage because I like to say that banks are not banks anymore. Banks are software companies or technology companies because you're defined by your competition. The competition more often than not now are highly leveraging data for real-time insights. And, and that's really gonna drive an operating, a change in operating principles and models for banks on the top of, of having a more agile infrastructure, of course. And bank is also going through this uh, uh, digital transformation uh, journey of your own. How are you prioritizing uh, that payment integration? Uh, um, today, you know, uh, payment uh, being siloed in different system. Uh, what is the imperative, if any, of uh, integrating that into a common, uh, common uh, hub of our platform and leveraging the ability to have some of this capability, um, ISO 2002 to the ability to have you know, data lake. Yes, it is something which MBank is doing as well, mm -hmm. uh, considering how we should streamline. It looks a lot like the architecture which you put up. Uh, we have the payments orchestration. We're trying to move mm -hmm. down all of our logic away from channels into a common layer. But a lot of this transformation comes with the promise of more of, of, of justifying the business case for this is really difficult. Mm -hmm. So putting in the new payments innovation or the new payment services into this and then slowly working on your legacy, it's a painful process. But it's something which we must do uh, in order to be able to streamline and in a way try to see how we can rationalize costs by getting this done. There's an upfront cash ask, which is difficult. Um, I think one of the ways by which we're trying to justify this is and also create a new revenue is mm -hmm. sponsor banking. So when we look at our own payments infrastructure, which our customers use, one way to create more revenue or create more scale is to be a utility provider for some of the fintechs. 
So one of the things we do, for instance, is for all of the small TPAs, third party um, settlers who try to provide state, uh, settlement for the smaller merchants on the paynet infrastructure, we help them with their settlement. We also provide access to the national payment settlement through our infrastructure to some of the uh, wallet providers. So all of this increases the revenue that is coming through our um, payment systems and allows us to make these investments in a way. Yes, uh, the next part of what you said, which is the data lake is more interesting. That's easier to justify. Uh, for instance, when we ran a data model, I think this is not a surprise. One of the things which we did in our data modeling is we tried to look at what is the predicator for primary operating banking? What makes mm -hmm. someone a primary operating customer of the bank? And what's the incremental um, revenue that you make from someone who's really into you? And this is again going back to the challenges which you said, which is how do you monetize payments, correct? Because the fee revenue is down to nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're running all of this and you're not making money on the payment per se. So some time ago, we were making the payments off the float. Now the names are compressing oh, there as yeah. well. So it's really about how you can bank the customer end to end for which you need the data. So here trying to analyze the payments that go through to understand why is money moving out of the bank? Why is money moving into the bank, into customers' accounts? And what does that tell us about the life stage and the opportunity to grab business away is something which is more interesting. And with tiny little experiments with data, something that we're doing as well, I think it's the secret. Uh, the big challenge here is that uh, really, payments for banks has been ceded to a lot of the non-bank entrants. Mm -hmm. And we're really in the second cycle of disruption where the disruptors themselves are getting disrupted. Different. Yes. So it's a very interesting uh, landscape. It's one where we found that being a, a backbone to some of these uh, newcomers is also something which allows us to participate even if indirectly. And if we keep the data and the data lake, how can we help understand trends from it and derive value from it? That's very insightful. Now, in terms of where you are in that transformation, you know, justifying making a business uh, case for it is very important. And uh, does it uh, easier? Uh, does it make it easier for a bank like M Bank in terms of where you are in terms of ranking? Um, position yourself as, as a disruptor or challenger to the bigger banks, uh, um, does that make it uh, kind of more more of a stronger business case? And uh, how are you doing? Are you doing big bank or are you doing uh, in, in phases? Definitely doing it in phases. Mm -hmm. Yes, there is also an advantage to be had being mid-sized where you have uh, less to lose and you can afford to take uh, a few chances. Yes, so you can present yourself as uh, more easily being able to take a leaf out of the disruptors book in terms of the strategies we can adopt. Um, so, but uh, to be honest, it's also a challenge in terms of the way we can build scale as a mid-sized player to be able to justify what we're trying to do to transform. Therefore, we necessarily have to be agile. We necessarily have to take it up in small chunks. Almost every transformation that we're doing on the whole digital landscape in the data area and the payments landscape is bite-sized. It is agile, it's small pieces based on mm -hmm. a hypothesis, prove it, then take the next chunk. And uh, I want to uh, get back to uh, Kun Tirat, uh, Time Commercial Bank. You're, you are one of the big four uh, in terms of I know your dominance of the, uh, the 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 market as well as in payments itself. Um, now, in terms, do you have a different uh, situation when it comes to building a business case for your retail payment uh, uh, new new system implementation? Do you do you face the the, the similar uh, issues and challenges? And, uh, and and how how do you go about your the the phasing of your uh, payment? Uh, transformation uh, project? 
Um, I think we, we are fortunate that um, during the, the prompt pay project, uh, the, the protocol has been changed into ISO 222. So we use that requirement to revamp the whole payment infrastructure and mm. we take uh, that time um, to re-evaluate all the pain points that we have in the in the our payment infra infrastructure. Didn't have that much challenge to get the, the budget required and get the sponsorship from all the senior executive and the board. Maybe a comment from uh, Pak Suryani from CTBC Indonesia in terms of uh, yeah, how, how are you approaching your, your payments transformation? Okay, thank you, Bun Ping. So I would say that the Indonesian market, it's a growing at the moment, but because of the pandemic, we are moving to a touchless condition, meaning that we are avoiding to uh, go to Dubai or anything like that. So the payment, uh, 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 payment application is uh, much more needed at the moment uh, here in Indonesia. But its bank is a different, uh, different case. Uh, their client is different because they have maybe a big bank or a small bank or a very uh, a captive bank like uh, in, in, in CTBC at the moment. Uh, we are not only serving the uh, Taiwanese client here in Indonesia, but also we are serving some of the uh, local and SOE clients here in Indonesia. So our, our, our payment application at the moment is uh, matching with the uh, requirement of our client here and also the, 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 the market here. So I would say that maybe because of the uh, uh, case of each bank is different, then uh, we, we, we need to uh, adjust with this kind of condition. But we have uh, followed the needs of, the, of our each client in here because we see this is uh, not only to support our third party funds because they want to put the money with us, but also to show that our bank has the capability to meet with its clients need for this one. Again, you see the technology is uh, number one needed for this one because uh, looking at the future where uh, all the fintech company already doing with the technology, so bank must also uh, follow this uh, condition. So I would say that uh, here in Indonesia, we are following the, the, the payment technology needed for its bank. Thank you, uh, Pak Suryadi. Nathan, if I uh, can also call on you to yeah, comment on the... We are at the corporate banking side anyway. Hmm. Um, how we were able to tied over our customers' requirements. When it came to um, uh, the recent lockdown that we had about mid of March, already the latter part, in RCBC, uh, talk about six months before the pandemic happened, mm -hmm. we already digitized our corporate online banking enrollment forms um, simply because we wanted uh, our ability to enroll our customers in a nimble way. Um, so um, that worked well for us. Uh, at the time that uh, the lockdown was initiated in the Philippines, there were a lot of our corporate customers who um, started inquiring on how they can shift from their check-based check -based payments to uh, electronic funds transfer. So we do have um, recent uh, domestic transfers, PesoNet and InstaPay that's um, mm working wonders for our corporate clients now. So um, we, um, we were able to um, help our customers get enrolled in no time. So the influx of these queries, uh, we were able to catch and uh, we were able to fulfill our promise to uh, digitize our customers. Um, we, it's a combination of uh, old and new customers. When I say old customers, they have been already poised to do EFT, domestic EFT transactions, but they never tried it simply because there wasn't any compelling reason to do so. So they just stuck mm -hmm. to analog payments like checks. Now. Um, but the big multinational companies that, um, you know, um, they were trying to cope uh, with the situation, how to pay their vendors, knowing that these multinational or uh, conglomerate co co uh, clients of ours are part of the essential industries to move about uh, essentials um, that's necessary, food, um, logistics companies, the like. You know? um, so our experience in terms of um, coping and helping our customers get by and um, be comfortable using our online banking system worked well. 
um, if there, uh, if at all there's a success story to RCBC. Um, statistically, uh, in the first four months of the pandemic, we were able to enroll about, what, 500 to 600 of our corporate clients already. Mm-hmm. Um, that's actually um, new clients, no? New clients. So um, we're very happy that we were able to catch the initial wave, the, the initial, the second wave, the third wave. Um, and it's continued to sell on its own, actually. Um, okay. uh, even the customers of ours who have been hesitant to go online, those um, conservative clients, we tell them, are you comfortable buying online your, or shopping online? And when they say yes, it's essentially the same thing when you enroll uh, mm. to our EFT. Uh, the payment uh, business is also becoming uh, harder to you know, uh, make money out of, right? Uh, uh, from the flow, low margins, as we have discussed, you know, uh, and uh, h- how do players become challengers themselves, become disruptor, come up with new business model, come up with um, uh, uh, micro uh, payment services uh, that you can earn a fee, um, uh, introduce value added services to uh, data that uh, your payment infrastructure can provide you uh, in order to make that business case uh, to, 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 to move on to a new payment system. How are you making that decision today um, uh, in the payment space? We try to mm-hmm. simplify the different uh, type of payments uh, system, the legacy payment system that we have into uh, a simpler uh, architecture here in in uh, in Bamandiri. We see the increasing uh, trends in in e-commerce payment, and then uh, we collaborate with those uh, e-commerce, whereby we provide them with also a, a facility whereby um, Man- Mandiri customers, when they uh, transact in those e-commerce, can use a facility, uh, a auto debit facility. In, embed in the e-commerce uh, uh, platform, thus the 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 user experience is uh, is uh, easier for them. Mm-hmm. And then the other thing that uh, that that give us a more uh, loyalty in terms of customer experience, not on the fee based income, but rather more on the loyalty of the customer. But on the fee base uh, from the payment side, we try to increase the number of uh, our branchless banking agents, where, whereby we provide. Uh, a system for these agents um, uh, for them to be able to accept uh, payments, multi-payments for those uh, unbanked customers like payment for electricity, telcos, mm-hmm. or even uh, other stuff like uh, multi-finance uh, loan payments, um, whereby the, the, fee, the fee is we, we split between us and the, and the agents. So those agents, in turn, they also uh, happy because they get a, a additional fee for for themselves as well. Rather than we cannot tap those unbankable people, we leverage uh, our branches agent to 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 help them uh, to help us in uh, tapping these markets. Uh, we already see quite a significant traction of fee base coming from from that. Uh, I think the challenge here is that. Um, this system that we have require uh, a good internet or telco uh, common uh, networks. While in Indonesia, we know the penetration of the, the, the internet is not 100% yet. So especially on the rural side, um, there are still some area that, that mm-hmm. have no uh, internet connections. But in those areas that we have internet connections, we try to penetrate the market using that. And uh, Dennis, the, 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 the same question in terms of um, how are you uh, looking at your payment uh, transformation, just b- making the business case for it, and also um, um, how are you uh, leveraging that to lower unit costs and uh, kind of uh, make more of a, a, a profitable, uh, profitable payment business out of it? On our end, we, we think that from a transactional fee out of the, you know all those, there's really not much uh, margins. So actually, even up to today, Union Bank uh, offers it for free, the mm. Instapay and uh, Pesonet transactions. But with the volume, is you really get a lot of the data. But where the money really is, is in the loans. Mm-hmm. I think uh, what, we've, what we're seeing is a lot of the fintechs, 
actually tries to generate a lot of uh, transactions and uh, you know get some transaction fee it is proving not to be too sustainable you know because uh, there's a lot of uh, costs are to be incurred with the increase in transactions etc and whatnot but those that can mine the data make use of the data and really uh, you know uh, provide different types of appropriate uh, loans uh, for them I think is is uh, the way to go. There are lots of new improvements that's gonna come. Uh, for example, for InstaPay. So there's now what they call InstaPay 2.0. Uh, we are one of the pilot banks uh, that uh, is doing it. So InstaPay was really more fund transfer from one bank to another, and it's zero cost. Mm -hmm. So that made it a, lot, uh, a bit difficult for the other fintechs actually because. They used to generate a transaction fee out of that. But when the bank says, uh, you know, bank to bank uh, transfer is zero cost. So a lot of the fintechs had to like, uh, where do we get the revenues, right? Uh, but now we're looking at InstaPay, not just for fund transfer, but to do direct bills payment during COVID-19. Uh, and because of the unemployment, a lot of people are going to online selling. Now, how do they get payments? No, so uh, so with these electronic payments coming in, like InstaPay 2.0, so that's that's helping a lot. And uh, what we're trying to do now is really help a lot of the online merchants uh, through a very simplified process, allow them to accept payments, whether it's InstaPay, PesoNet, Carded, Visa, Mastercard, or even EFIs. We're we're getting a lot of traction there. Uh, with our technology company UBX, uh, they've introduced yeah. uh, what what we call Box, uh, BUX. So that that allows a lot of the online merchants to be onboarded. We have uh, lots of of them in our ecosystem right now. The uh, registration for more digital only bank, right? Uh, now converting some of the rural banking license to digital only uh, 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 digital only banks licenses. Um, now right. going forward, how, how how do you see that interplay uh, between commercial banks and digital only banks? Some of the big banks, they look at what the fintechs do, and their mentality is, I'll I learn more about it and I'll do it myself because I'm bigger, I have better resources, etc. And th this is why we exposed our APIs, you know, so all our capabilities, any fintechs, if you want to embed in your app. You know, capability to do bills payment, fund transfer, buy load, etc. It's there. You said our belief is that the bank has a unique uh, value. Mm -hmm. you know, it's it's been there for many years. But we think the fintechs have a unique value as well. You know, they're very focused. They focus on one. They act quickly, uh, and you know, they can they can develop more quickly because of that. Now, our belief is, uh, you know, to embrace that. And uh, you know, in in our DNA, we call it Ubuntu. You know, but it's, mm -hmm. it's really yeah, work, yeah, working, uh, yeah, working together. Uh, so when we work with fintechs, the the statistics, of course, is that eighty five percent of them will fail. Uh, only fifteen percent will will survive. Our mentality is we want to help them. Don't just give them the fish for mm -hmm. the loan, you know, right. and expect them to pay. Teach them how to fish. Teach them how to survive how to become competitive, how to become better. So we've created, for example, a, uh, a platform for SMEs called Global Linker. It's about mm -hmm. 60, 70,000. It's like the LinkedIn of SMEs. Oh. And we're shouldering the cost, but they can, they, can, they can sell their products to other SMEs. So we're creating those uh, ecosystems and platforms uh, for them. Also with the program we called Eureka, so mm -hmm. there were lots of SMEs, they go to us for loans, etc. And then we said, but you don't have internet presence. How can you even survive? So we created online presence for them for free. Okay. So again, what I, I think what's more important is really the uh, mentality. You really want the prosperity inclusion. You want to really strengthen the middle, uh, you know, the middle uh, uh, economy. Uh, provide the financial services to the to the mass uh, market, and the only way to do that is through technology. Mm -hmm. Bring down your cost to a very minimal level so that you can offer those services uh, for them. How they are facing um, the uh, this whole move towards more digital uh, payments, uh, you know, onboarding more customers digitally, facing competition, and also opportunities that are coming from e-commerce and fintech players. 
how do you see those yep. developments? It's important to sort of understand um, how you can work with some of the more original fintech. It, it's a matter of you know the the role that we can um, play for the industry um, and the ten thousand banks that are connected to the Swift network. Um, there's, there's scale. We operate as a cooperative. Many of the banks on this call um, actually own Swift, right? Um, so um, there's lots of investment over many years to. Um, you know, provide this safe, reliable, highly trusted and scaled um, infrastructure across the globe. Um, there's a lot of commentary um, on low value retail transactions, but we didn't mm. quite get to the kind of cross-border context of kind mm. of linking up cross-border payments into instant systems. That's something we're very focused on at the moment and helping the industry solve for standards. Um, it's a real challenge on kind of real-time screening as well. Mm. And then the last thing I would say is um, we're, we're quite pleased at the moment because we've been building out a, a new service which is focused on low-value payments. So here we're talking about cross-border payments at less than US $10,000 a, a transaction. And essentially it would, what we're trying to solve there is the upfront transparency and predictability mm. to both the experience that a customer can expect with the payment um, and then also the the fees that a customer will see as well. So we piloted this um, a couple of months ago and we had banks joining all over the world to provide this more consistent um, low value payment experience and what, what a customer of your financial institution will experience, right? is that upfront presentation of the fees. Um, over time, you'll have a lot more understanding of how long payments take. This all runs foundationally on the, the SWIFT GPI service that 70% um, of our SWIFT cross-border payments around the world now are running on SWIFT GPI, so they're tracked up end-to-end. So it uses all of that to build out that low-value payment service as well. Stephen, some comments in terms of what you hear from some of the banks. Um, some of the challenges in terms of getting to the starting block for some of this payment um, uh, infrastructure and our transformation, justifying mm -hmm. the cost and you know, finding uh, uh, viability and you know, also sustainable uh, revenue for uh, payment services. What I would uh, advise uh, banks is, is to make sure that they look at it as not just a, a cost component, not just fixing something that's broken or not just doing uh, or complying for complying sake, but look at it strategically. What is the value of the payments to the business mm -hmm. and make sure that the investments in the payments transformation program uh, are aligned in such a way that you're able to uh, deliver revenues um, into the bank. And that, that could be exposed by APIs and, and, and other uh, capabilities, but make sure that you you can build those additional revenues to support the business case. Mm -hmm. If it's just about cost, it's not going to get anywhere. Yeah. Uh, uh, but it also, it needs to be open, 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 right? It needs to be data, 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 data. and have all of those things ready because you just don't know that the, what's coming in payments. What we've learned over the last 15 years is, is that the space transforms itself dramatically and very quickly. Um, so, you know, you need to be uh, anticipating the unknown, let's say, and making sure that your architecture is able to support that. Good, Tiran, any kind of uh, concluding remarks from you? Um, I think we, we hear the same story everywhere, right? So mm. we are no different. Um, we, say we face the same challenge. I think uh, it's the matter of execution. And uh, okay, fi finally, I'll have uh, yeah, uh, Chin Tan to have a few words and uh, before we close up. I was quite quite happy to yeah. hear the views of all the participants today. Uh, clearly validates that we are all on the same page, right? Mm. One, all of us clearly see the opportunity. There's an opportunity in terms of uh, the entire new age payment methods, whether it's domestic or cross border, and and how it adds value for our clients. So I think. Nobody is lost on the business case. Everybody appreciates that and fully sees that opportunity, whether it's on the retail side or on the corporate side of the business. That's one. Second, about business case validation. But quite often, in my view, it's not about business case validation because we all believe sooner or later we need to be in it. You can't yeah. be out of an instant payment or a, or a cross-border payment efficiency for long. Right? So I think the challenge is the prioritization of that payment uh, uh, 
use case or whatever you may be covering for that point as compared to other conflicting priorities at that point so we are we all have finite tech resources we all have uh, you know and then there are various regulatory and non regulatory book of work mm. and within all of that how do you prioritize and take some strategic uh, developments is where i think the the challenge for all of us is and i clearly see this to be a kind of medium term challenge it's not short term it's not 21 yep. it's not 22 perhaps 21 to 25 but mm-hmm. that's where the fun is so quite quite excited to be in this space okay now so the payment landscape continues to in- evolve i think uh, covid-19 has been a catalyst uh, for a, a lot more uh, digital uh, transaction remote transactions um, it also created a platform for greater collaboration we see you know uh, example when uh, dennis mentioned that the number of uh, digital trans- uh, digital transaction for the first time in the philippines um, exi- uh, exceeded that of atm transaction uh, this this whole uh, movement towards digital is is clear to see um, and it creates new business model to uh, work with um, a whole host of service provider uh, deliver a new customer experience um, and uh, traditionally payments has always been uh, a lot from the interest uh, float uh, part of the you know of the balance sheet so to speak you know with a uh, narrowing margin uh, there is a need to look at more creative areas to uh, identify revenue opportunities and as a uh, vinda uh, shared with us um, developing the business case for for payment uh, transformation is also a case for identifying areas where they can you know uh, identify and achieve incremental revenue and, and and that's what they have achieved and also to look at payment as a competitive advantage uh, to disrupt the uh, incumbents to be uh, challengers themselves uh, so as payments evolve uh, this critical uh, part of the business um, can be enabled by you know new infrastructure new capabilities uh, uh, as uh, michael from swift mentioned there are some of this capability that can be you know shared utilities uh, that you know individual uh, institutions do not need to kind of reinvent and individually uh, invest uh, how a lot of that uh, that uh, uh, service or capability in sanctions in in a- aml can be shared uh, across industry Uh, that are, that is some of the opportunities that that is available uh, but you know uh, uh, it's also time that uh, the industry look at opportunities to leverage uh, beyond just you know cost for payments so and, and this is a continuing conversation which we will have uh, with the industry as we cover this so uh, right now let me just thank uh, tirat chintan uh, steven and michael for Uh, your insights and for all our guests who who given us your views uh, for joining us today and we hope that uh, you have uh, uh, benefited for each other you know a sharing of experiences okay thank you uh, chintan that uh, thank you everyone for your insights